ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to have Geoffrey Gordon visiting us. Geoffrey's uh, working in Perth, at the University of Western Australia at the moment on a sabbatical visit. Geoffrey and I have worked together for a number of years. I mean, it goes back at least eight years, I think. Uh, I visited Jeff, Jeffrey in, in Israel twice, and the work Jeffrey does is extraordinary in its breadth and its depth. And so it's a terrific uh, pleasure and indeed an honor that Jeffrey is able to come and visit us this week. He's with us for the entire week and tell us about work that he's still doing in solar energy. So Jeffrey is now an emeritus professor, but I don't think Jeffrey's going to retire anytime soon. So Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be at UNSW and in this department, really the preeminent university center for research in the solar energy sciences. And it's, uh, it's quite exhilarating to be exposed even within my first day and a half here to the, to the eclectic uh, research in almost every area of uh, solar energy research that's being pursued here. I want to express a particular debt of gratitude to Ned for his generous invitation for arranging my visit here. Uh, and uh, it, it's been a pleasure knowing Ned for a number of years, working together, publishing together, and now we're, uh, we're reviving the collaboration and trying to advance some interesting concepts. So now let, let's have some fun with solar energy. I want to try to cover three areas that might be viewed as unorthodox. I hope you'll find them as exciting as I do, applications of solar energy research. And Ned spoke about breadth and depth. Well, three topics in 40 minutes. So the depth will be limited. Hopefully the breadth will be there. And just to give you some uh, intimation, of where I'll be going uh, during the coming minutes. These three topics, the first is uh, using immensely concentrated sunlight in a unique way to generate uh, novel nanomaterials, particularly inorganic uh, nanostructures. The second will be something we're particularly excited about and quite recent, which is achieving massive improvements in the photon efficiency of photosynthesis in algae in a center like this that might be viewed as useful for producing biofuels but whatever you can use algae for, pharmaceuticals, antibodies, wonderful. And the third, which is very close to, I assume, the hearts of everyone here, is actually in photovoltaic science and optics, and it relates to onboard solar electricity systems for private commercial space missions with the emphasis on private and commercial, which establishes a whole new set of ground rules of specifications that never had to be contended with before in, uh, in space missions. Let's call it the, uh, the appetizer, the main course, and the dessert. Your, the dessert will be your, what you're most familiar with. So first, let me, let me cite what I'm not going to relate to, which are the successful, mature solar paradigms for electricity production. The first one, uh, when I say mature and large scale, I mean at the gigawatt scale. The first one is solar thermal production of uh, electricity. One concentrates sunlight. There are two uh, workhorses for this, the line focus system of parabolic troughs in the upper right, the point focus system, nominal point focus system, of uh, solar towers with a field of mirrors around them. In both cases, one uh, produces temperatures needed to generate steam, and then you drive conventional steam turbines. Yearly average conversion efficiencies for these, and I stress yearly average, not peak, best can, at the best moment at normal incidence, but yearly average is about 16% at best for both of those technologies. That's a coincidence. But the big advantage is it admits gas backup and thermal storage. And that's the temperature range that we're talking about, which is what utilities call the spatchability. In other words, it enables them to avoid having to build power plants. It's not just saving energy. The other technology, the bringing the coals to Newcastle, right, is photovoltaics, direct conversion, there's anyone in the audience who's not from this department, just one minute to explain. This is mainly silicon technology. It's affordable. Modules are about 20% efficient. It's stable, robust, modular, growing at a fantastic pace. But 
the limitation is electrical storage technologies are still inadequate. That won't be the case in a generation from now, but right now it is. And this is why, even though it's less expensive and much more efficient than solar thermal, um, there are still large solar thermal power plants. And today, I won't be exploring either of these. Rather, I want to delve into novel, unorthodox uses of solar energy, aspiring to futuristic applications rather than just implementing these mature technologies. But first, a word about from where I come. Uh, ben Gurion University of the Negev established uh, a faculty of desert sciences we call the Blaustein Institutes for Desert Research, interdisciplinary faculty. We try to explore both fundamental and applied scientific issues. We were founded in 77. I had the privilege of joining a few months later. You see the photograph from a drone on the left of our entire community. It's not just a university campus. It's a university campus embedded within a village, population about 2,000, overlooking one of the most spectacular desert uh, valleys, uh, canyons, ravines, uh, that I've had the uh, pleasure of visiting. And on the right, you see the map of Israel with uh, a star indicating uh, where we're located in the heart of the Negev, the southern half of Israel is a desert area. You see cities that may be more familiar to you, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv in the center and moving to the north. And uh, because we're in such an isolated area, our graduate students uh, don't have many distractions in their spare time. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a photograph of one of my graduate students on a hike we took, not far from where I live. Uh, Z, this is Mitzpe Ramon. So you know very well where that is, a small city south of where we are. But I like to show this slide, not just to indicate how our students get their, expend their energy, but that what we like to encourage our students to do is to aspire not to small incremental advances, but to take risks to take some bold steps. Says you cannot cross a chasm of three meters in three steps of one meter each. And we like to illustrate it with that. Now, uh, I've heard about faculty recruitment here at UNSW. And I, it's one of the most important activities that a university has. And I, we take pride in the fact that our first prime minister, at the time that the State of Israel was founded in 1948, David Ben-Gurion, took a personal interest, a personal involvement in trying to recruit university faculty. Let me show you what may be the most famous uh, example of faculty recruitment. This was in Princeton University in 1952. At the time, uh, Ben-Gurion was visiting with Albert Einstein, not so much to ask him to come as professor of physics, but to be president of the State of Israel, which Einstein gratefully declined. After that, Ben-Gurion said, well, and then how about coming to Hebrew University as professor of physics? And Einstein, with his uh, usual smile and sense of humor, explained why he would gratefully decline that also. Unfortunately, we now know Einstein would uh, pass away three years later. But you have to give the prime minister credit for making a personal trip to the United States in order to recruit faculty for our universities. And just so you don't think on the, from the map of Israel that we're really that large a country, this is a one-to-one -one overlay on your wonderful continent. So we, we do take things, in, we, we realize that we have to take things in proportion. So now let me return to science. Solar generation of nanomaterials. I'd like to view it as a new and distinct solar paradigm. That is exploitation of solar. Uh, synthesizing singular nanomaterials at the service of material science, of human technology, via immensely concentrated sunlight rather than the conventional applications of heat, electricity, or fuel. And the examples we've succeeded with, and I'll show you some of them shortly, are the chemical compounds that are listed here. There is a, uh, there is a method to the madness, meaning there is a reason it's these particular compounds, which I'll show you in a moment. There is a limited number that are good candidates. And the practical motivation is that each of these chemical compounds in nano form, either nanotubes or close cage structures, sometimes called fullerene-like structures, they have one, one or more remarkable physical properties, lubricating properties, optical, thermal, catalytic, electronic, and adhesive. And everything I'm about to show you has been done in collaboration with Reshef Tena, who's professor of material science at the Weizmann Institute of Science. He's the 
grandfather of the area of inorganic nanomaterials, that is non-carbon nanomaterials. And my colleagues, my dear colleagues in my department at Ben Gurion University, Daniel Foreman and Eugene Katz, again, just a small intimation in the lower right as to where we'll be going. And uh, the advantages of the solar method I'll show you relative to the nano material synthesis methods that are available today, like pulse laser ablation and chemical vapor deposition, is that the solar method is completely safe. We have no toxic reagents. It's far faster. It proceeds in minutes rather than hours or days. And it's scalable, unlike chemical vapor deposition, let's say, which gives it the potential of commercialization. So for those of you who may not come from the area of uh, nanostructures, just a quick review. The first nanostructures that were uh, discovered and for which the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded years ago was carbon-60 and some other close cage structures of carbon, but most prominently carbon-60. Made from graphite, which is the layered compound illustrated schematically here. Carbon-60, the drawing is there. And subsequently, nanotubes were found as well. Again, this is pure carbon. But there are sobering realities. One is that carbon, what was not known when the first carbon nanotubes were generated, was they turn out to be carcinogenic to human beings. That became basically the end of the carbon nanotube commercialization efforts. And for carbon-60, those of you who work in organic photovoltaics are intimately familiar with it, well, there's no rational synthesis that's been found to date for carbon-60. It has to be made in arc discharge chambers, which means it's exorbitant and it's quite problematic to scale it up. And then uh, in 1992, Reshef Tena at the Weissman Institute of Science came along and said, uh, why just carbon? Aren't there other materials that can form nanotubes and fullerenes? What is special about graphite? And he realized, of course, immediately that it's the layered structure nature. And um, it should not be restricted to carbon. And he identified immediately molybdenum disulfide, diselenide, tungsten disulfide, tungsten diselenide, gallium sulfide. And there have been prominent successes with all of these. And the good news is that the nanostructures, nanotubes included, so far have not been found to pose any occupational health hazards. So we can proceed with these experiments without any problems. Now, these are examples of just three layered materials, graphite included. And what's special about it is they have very strong chemical bonds within the planes, covalent bonds. But between the planes are weak. Uh, van der Waal bonds, so it becomes relatively easy to separate them if there's enough energy input. And as you blast them into those uh, metastable structures, they then have a competition whether they fold in on themselves and saturate the dangling bonds. Just to show you a schematic of what molybdenum disulfide and cesium oxide look like. Now a, chrom a chronological promenade through our solar concentrators, which are the ones we used for the nanomaterial synthesis. The first generation is what we call a solar fiber optic mini dish. If you come from physics, it's just a Cassegrain telescope. If you're an astrophysicist, you've probably seen all the optics I'm going to show you now. If you're in solar, they may be a little less familiar. So you see a schematic on, the, on your left of what we built, our little Cassegrain telescope with a parabolic mirror, a small secondary mirror to image the sun into an optical fiber that brings concentrated sunlight into the laboratory where we can perform experiments in air-conditioned comfort. And you see the dimensions here on the size of the dish and the diameter of the optical fiber. On the right, you see uh, our technician holding the distal tip of the fiber just before we thread it into the laboratory. And in the middle, through a neutral density filter, we photograph uh, an experiment on an ampule that is evacuated with cesium oxide, in this case, uh, crystals inside trying to form nanostructures of it. Our first effort was cesium oxide. Reshef Tenet shows it. Uh, cesium oxide is used, as many of you who work in optics may know, to tailor photo detector and photo emitter coatings. That is the work function for them. But it's violently, one of the most violently reactive compounds known on exposure to air. And so uh, it's quite expensive to uh, prepare these, uh, these surfaces. It is done in industry. And Reshev said, if we could make fullerene-like structures, close case structures, all these bonds that react violently would be saturated. We would have a stable cesium oxide material with the right optical properties. So if we could produce it, that should mitigate their reactivity. So we did the experiment here, cesium oxide in vacuum. 
And uh, here are the results. We were stunned. This was the first experiment we tried. You know, I think there's some law in physics and chemistry. You have a concept, you do the first experiment, it doesn't work, you try to figure out what went wrong. And the, here, everything went right the first time. So we were, we were just uh, very lucky in that sense. Uh, these are sample transmission electron microscope images of the fullerene-like structures we found. You see the scale bars there. So here we realized we had an inexpensive photothermal process. I say it's photothermal, we found no evidence for photochemistry. For synthesizing uh, fullerene-like cesium oxide with immensely concentrated sunlight, confirmed. For those of you who do uh, materials characterization, these are the tools we use. If you're not a materials characterization, we just have to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that what you're looking at there is, first of all, only cesium and oxygen in a ratio of two cesiums to one oxygen, and that the lattice spacing is exactly what cesium oxide exhibits. And of course, it, it, I wouldn't be showing this to you otherwise. Um, so that was the first uh, success, and we were off and running. And then uh, we, were, we found that we were able to produce a silicon uh, oxide nanofibers and nanospheres, which, is, which are valuable in the nanophotonics industry. And although it had been done before, this is a process that until, until this time was done with some really nasty toxic chemicals and required hours of, um, of high temperature chemistry. And here in 10 minutes of uh, some cheap precursor materials in an evacuated quartz ampule, we're seeing nanowires, nanospheres um, of, of all kinds. And the apparent key to the success in the solar route was we were able to, we are able to create a naturally an ultra hot and continuous annealing region which is sizable. Uh, so that the molecules that are blasted into the gas phase have enough time and enough heat to rearrange and form these structures. Reshev said if we can make silicon oxide we should be able to take advantage of a well-known disproportionation reaction of silicon monoxide and produce nanosilicon wires, pure silicon. Again it had been done before with the same drawbacks, toxic reagents and many hours of chemical reactions and here in 10 minutes we were able to generate in high yield pure silicon nanostructures of the type you see on the right there, nanowires all over the place and the inset there is just to show you we do see the characteristic three angstrom a lattice spacing in silicon in the high resolution transmission electron microscopy. But we were limited in the temperatures we could achieve with the fiber after all light emerges from a fiber it's diverging we wanted to converge, get higher concentration and higher temperatures. Because when you go to higher temperatures, you can access more metastable and therefore more remarkable and exciting nanostructures. So we designed and built a Gregorian telescope. So outside, I don't show you outside the lab, on the left is a, uh, a heliostat that is a flat mirror that tracks the sun, brings the beam into the lab. Anchored in the roof is a parabolic dish. You see the uh, dimensions and numerical aperture. Confocal with it is a small elliptical dish and we go to the proximate focus and there we achieve a concentration of 15,000 times ambient uh, solar. So you see the drawing on the left and the, again through a neutral density filter, the, uh, the uh, photograph during the experimentation. We went back to uh, molybdenum disulfide which uh, had already been shown in two experiments that were very difficult to reproduce in other labs. They are the true inorganic fullerenes, the basic smallness limit, and they form nanooctahedra of the type you see on the right. The practicality, if they could be made in high yield, super lubricant, super catalyst, particularly in the petroleum industry, but the yields were too low. So first we wanted to check if we could produce these nanooctahedra, and we did. That's the electron microscope photograph of what we generated with the sun. You see the drawings there to give you a feeling for the scale. But in the same experiment, you also see the much more common uh, quasi-spherical large molybdenum, molybdenum disulfide nanostructures. Here's an electron micrograph of it. Many labs around the world have no problem producing this by other methods. Uh, so you have the two extremes. And uh, is it possible to produce a hybrid nanostructure, meaning a core of the fundamentally small structure uh, embedded within quasi-spherical shells? Could it exist? Now the reason that we ask this seemingly prosaic question is it's not that pedestrian. The motivation is the nanooctahedra are metallic. 
the large structures were semiconducting. No one had ever produced a single particle that had both metallic and semiconducting properties embedded with one another. So is that possible? The question had never been asked. And if I would, I'll tell you the truth instead of what I could tell you. The truth is um, we hadn't asked the question either. We were just doing this experiment and something remarkable showed up. Exactly that. The first time one saw a metallic nano-octahedral, fundamentally small nanostructure, seamlessly morphing into the uh, quasi-spherical shells around it. The black and white is the electron micrograph. The yellow is just a drawing, the artist's rendition, so to speak, um, which we were quite excited about. Now, all of our experiments had one drawback. They had low yields, and uh, Reshef was quite concerned about increasing yields, so we decided to try metal catalysis. We tried a number of metals, trial and error. They failed. We tried lead, plumbum, and uh, we hit the jackpot. So uh, we were able to produce nanotubes from these four metal dye chalcogenides in high yields. These are some micrographs of the um, tungsten diselenide. And the solar route also enabled us to decipher the reaction pathway. We had our own pre preconceived notion what the reaction pathway was from some uh, crystallites you buy off the internet into the final beautiful nanotubes. And we were wrong. But the way we could determine it is by basically taking snapshots. We performed the solar experiment for one minute. Stop, observe, two minutes, three. This is like taking uh, photographs. And we were able to decipher what the mechanism was uh, so now we're much wiser and we know how to proceed with generating high yield nanotubes from these materials. And uh, finally, we went to uh, the highest concentration you can achieve in air with realistic materials. It's our latest solar furnace. It's an aplanat. Uh, an aplanat is an imaging optic that eliminates the two leading orders of geometric aberration, spherical aberration and coma. Um, it's a variation on a very good kind of telescope as well. Again, you see the dimensions here, uh, and it achieves 30,000 times uh, ambient solar intensity, or whatever units you like, 30 watts per square millimeter, 30 megawatts per square meter. Uh, that's a measured flux. That's not just some ray trace. And we tried silicon carbide to make nanostructures, uh, nanowires, which uh, again have a great uh, uh, are of great interest in, uh, in practical chemical applications and we succeeded as you see here with high yield uh, silicon carbide nanowires and the uh, higher resolution to ensure yes we have one silicon one carbon and the characteristic uh, two and a half angstrom uh, lattice spacing. Uh, and again it's safe and it's rapid. In progress right now and I'm glad to report we're having some really lovely success is graphene in high yield in a method that's scalable and boron nitride fullerenes or nano onions. So with that, I finished the first part and now I'm changing track completely. End of one, start of two. Ultra high uh, bioproductivity from algae. This is done in collaboration in my department with Yair Zarmi, who's really responsible for most of the neat theoretical ideas I'll be showing you. And an experimental collaboration with a wonderful group at Reliance Industries in Mumbai, India. This is the uh, Fossil Fuel Corporation of India. They opened a few years ago. They decided to develop a biofuel division based on algae. So our aim is dramatic increases in algal bioproductivity. And I'll show you a predictive capability we developed, which our colleagues in India have now confirmed experimentally. I would not have the temerity to just show you a model without experimental evidence. And our strategy is to find the optimal synchronization of what nature has built in is a biological time scale and the photonic time scales that we have control over. And we asked ourselves at the outset, do algae have a built-in potential for far higher bioproductivity than found in nature? Has evolution given them this possibility to increase the efficiency with which a photon is used to generate starch or sugar? And the key degree of freedom I'm about to show you is imposing light-dark cycles pulsed light on algae. Uh, there are many papers on what are called flashing light in the literature. 
they reach the conclusion there is no advantage in photon efficiency by flashing light, which at first deterred us, but we quickly realized that they were all uh, plagued by a misguided choices of the magnitudes of the time scales. The photographs here are the standard algae technologies you'll see in the world, outdoor algae ponds, outdoor uh, slightly more sophisticated photobioreactors. They're indoors, and we're going to use light-emitting diodes to perform the experiments, and I will even at the end of this brief section advocate for seriously considering using pulsed LEDs for commercial level uh, algae breeding. Now, we went to our biologist colleagues and said, what's the simplest picture of photosynthesis you could give us? And this is what they gave us. Now, I, I, I have a little bit of consolation here. I know I don't have 30 biologists sitting in the audience. I may have some, and if you're there, I appreciate your being here, and I'd appreciate your criticisms afterwards. The bottom line for photosynthesis is the red reaction there, right? Uh, I guess you're quite familiar with that even if you're not from biology. You take carbon dioxide and water molecules, you add visible light, what's called photosynthetically active radiation, just a biologist's way of saying visible light, and you get starch and oxygen. Of course, if they're in the dark, they reverse the reaction, they respire, just like we respire. You take sugar and oxygen and out comes carbon dioxide and water, like when we're breathing. And I looked at this and I said, wait, 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 you know, what, what does a physicist do? You want to know, can I boil this down to a key rate limiting step, analyze that? Maybe I don't capture all the physics of the problem, but we can make some nice advances. So how simple a biophysical picture can suffice? And for this, I, to show you the spirit of what we did, I'd like to mention a story that happened in Israel, a physicist's approach, minimum complexity, maximum physical insight. So a number of years ago, in, in Israel, there are many communal uh, farms called kibbutzim. Many of them have cow sheds, and they wanted to increase the milk output from the cows. So they came to the physics department at Hebrew University and said, do you think you could work with us to model this problem? They said, sure, no problem. So they, they um, received the information they needed, went back to the office. A month later, they came back to give the seminar. The professor went to the board and said, consider a spherical cow of uniform density. That was the beginning of his lecture. So I'm going to give you the analog of that for photosynthesis. But the reason I'm going to ask you to humor me is afterwards, I'm going to show you some really impressive experimental data that it works. I'm not saying it's the whole picture, but it works. And that means we're capturing most of the physics. So here is our proposal, actually only part of this diagram, for boiling photosynthesis down to the absolute skeleton. There, there are two photosystems called photosystem two and one. Ironically, photosystem two is the one that operates first when a photon is accepted. So first of all, photons come in to a chlorophyll molecule. Chlorophyll molecules have antennas. And there are ultra-fast photochemical processes. I mean, picoseconds to nanoseconds. This is, for us, essentially time zero. It's just like solid-state physics. One photon generates an electron hole pair. No surprise. But then the electron starts to enter a chemical process. And one electron can generate what's called a quinone acceptor. That's a chemical molecule. And the time scale for that is about 0.2 milliseconds. This time scale, as I'll show you shortly, is only relevant, only germane, for very high photon flux densities, higher than ambient sunlight. Can be achieved with solar concentrators or with LEDs, if you're very close to the surface of the LED. But that's not of real practical interest right now. So once you have this quinone acceptor, two of them combine to form the key. The key molecule is called plastoquinone. I'll call it PQ here for short. But photosynthesis is built in a pool a storage facility, and it has a capacity of roughly seven. It varies from strain to strain um, and, and how, how the algae are acclimated, but th this is roughly the magnitude of that pool. And then comes the rate limiting step. The delivery time from the time the photon comes in until it's delivered to the next photosystem, which operates very slowly but has an enormous capacity, so it's not rate limiting. It's called photosystem one, and that rate limiting step we know from other experiments, is about 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds. This is very important, and the pool capacity 
is very important. You know, you, 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 can, all, you, you can think of this um, in, 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 in rather prosaic terms. Let's say you're, you're going to your physician. And uh, so you have the waiting room, and you have the physician, and there are people who are coming to visit the physician. So the rate at which the people are coming in, but there's a finite capacity for the waiting room. If the people come too fast, people have to be turned away. And the physician can only, pros can only examine people at a certain rate. And so you have all, so the rate coming in, the rate at which they can be processed, and the capacity of the waiting room determine how many people are turned away, um, how many of them can be treated. Now the rate at which people come in is the photon impingement rate. We control that. E even if it's solar, we, we can control that. The size of the waiting room, nature has built that in. The rate at which the physician can process people, the 10 that's built in. So we, we have to find the right synchronization of photonic time scales and biological time scales. So in short, one photon generates one electron. That's essentially instantaneous. Two photons are needed to produce the key molecule. That means that the statistics at which photons arrive on an antenna, that's going to play a pivotal role in the analysis. And if that pool is full and photons keep on generating these molecules, then clogging occurs. It's a waste of photonic input. This is basically why photosynthesis appears to be so inefficient. Understand it's sunlight. Sunlight is continuous. It just keeps on inputting the photons, and they cannot be processed fast enough. So this is what motivates us to consider pulse light to surmount the bottleneck, to synchronize this. Now, let me do some arithmetic. Not calculus, not just, I call it photon arithmetic. Let's make a coarse prediction based on this simple picture. The rate of photon input is the intensity of the light times the cross-section of an antenna, I times A. Now, we know from electron microscopy, the order of magnitude of an antenna is one square nanometer. If I go outside and measure under a clear sky, midday, peak solar intensity in the units that biologists like, which is micromoles of photons per second per square meter of collection area, it's 2,000. By the way, this refers only to photons in the visible. The other photons are useless. So if I have, let's say, half a sun intensity, 1,000, area of one square nanometer is 600 photons per second. Two photons are needed to generate the key molecule. So I can generate one key molecule, one plastoquinone, every 3.3 milliseconds. Now, the continuous radiation, that pool is always full. There's some initial transient, which is insignificant over a period of seconds or minutes. And there's a crossing time of 10 milliseconds. But that means only one PQ can be harvested every 10 milliseconds. So now you start to see where this is leading us. There are three PQs generated every 10 milliseconds, but only one can be processed under continuous irradiation. So what that tells me is, if I pulse the light well, I should be able to increase the photon efficiency of algae under this irradiation by a factor of three, by 200%. This is not some small incremental uh, improvement of 5 or 10 percent is a factor of 3 at this light intensity, which is realistic. So we said to our colleagues in India, let's do it. Let's take uh, white LEDs, 10 millisecond pulse. That's the intensity. It should generate 3 PQs. The capacity is 7, so there's no problem. And then we provide the algae with enough time to digest the 3 PQs. Obviously, much longer than that. And we should get a factor of three improvement in photon efficiency in algae. And they said, this sounds too good to be true. So they did the experiments. We even went to Mumbai to be with them for this. And here are the data. On the ordinate is the specific growth rate, and I stress per photon. Per photon, not per unit time. Per photon. And it's normalized to the experiment on the continuous light. Nothing is pulsed. So I wrote that. So the dark time is, so what I have here is I fix the light intensity when the light is on of the LEDs, but I pulse them. And I just change the dark time. Zero is continuous radiation, obviously. The dark time's in milliseconds. And you see here, the blue dots are the measurements. You see the standard deviations. And so with enough digestion time, in this case, 200 to 300 milliseconds, there's a factor of three to three and a half improvement in the photon efficiency of algae. We were stunned. 
but of course very gratified. It turns out the same simplistic model can even account for how this improvement depends on the light intensity. So the experiment I showed you, in this case the abscissa is the light intensity in the standard units. Again, 1000 is about half a sun. That's where this experiment was done. Here is the pulsed and continuous uh, result. And here you see the specific growth rate per photon, uh, 300 millisecond uh, dark time. And you see that uh, the improvement diminishes as you go to lower intensity. All that follows very simply from what I just showed you um, a few seconds ago. Now, those of you who look a little more closely, you may say, wait, you see the error bar, the, the standard deviation on the continuous and the pulse? The pulse is much bigger standard deviation. Um, if you're interested in that, during the question and answer period, ask me why. Because if you're a physicist, you'll love it. If you're a biologist, you will grimace. So our basic prediction is, for continuous irradiation, let's say at what intensity should bioproductivity saturate, meaning reach an asymptote. Again, with simple photon arithmetics. This is something biologists don't ask. They, they, they do the experiments. All their results are wonderful. But they cannot predict from a simple first principles what this should be. But let's do the arithmetic. When does clogging occur in that PQ channel when I have continuous irradiation? You, you do the arithmetic with the numbers I gave you. I'll spare you the intermediate step. It's in the units. Remember, 2,000 is full sunlight. It's about 330. And then we did the experiment. Here is the bioproductivity against the light intensity. We predict it should saturate at about 330. And it does. So it, with remarkably unsophisticated uh, model, one can account for the behavior of algal uh, bioproductivity. And we can predict the factor of three enhancement. But there's a trivial catch to this, of course. If the light is on for 10 milliseconds and off for 300, and I say, how much have you produced per hour? You know, very little, obviously, because the light is off most of the time. I'm speaking about the efficiency per photon, not per unit time. So how can we translate this advance into a commensurate increase in bioproductivity, mainly in the biomass per hour? Now, that is not a fundamental problem. That's a, a sophisticated problem in reactor engineering. There are two kinds of pathways. I could do this with, if you enforce me to do it outdoors with solar reactors, with innovative optomechanical systems, it can be done. I won't burden you now with what the solutions look like, but it, it has solutions. I don't know how economic they'd be, but the problem can be solved. Another is to use indoor pulsed LED systems where we decouple the solar and photon delivery. Photovoltaics out there, LEDs inside. We can tailor the spectrum, we can tailor the intensity, the pulsing protocols. All this makes sense if you want to produce biofuel from algae only if the source of the electricity comes from solar or wind or hydroelectric or dare I say nuclear. And these are challenges and realizations which are reserved for our future reunions. But just before I came here, we have one final exciting prospect or prediction that a higher light intensity and or longer pulse time could, in a different strain of algae, which has different antenna areas, slightly different pool size, we predict could increase the efficiency by up to a factor of 10 and now we have the experimental evidence for that factor of 10 in photon efficiency. And the payoffs for this, once it can be translated into fluxes, hundreds of percent higher bioproductivity. With LEDs, we can operate indoors, no contamination of the cultures, 24 hours a day. We control the spectrum. By the way, algae work very well with monochromatic red light. They don't need sunlight. Plants do. Algae, most of the algae strains, microalgae for this do not. We can control the intensity, the pulse times, and the temperature. Algae performance is also sensitive to temperature. It's a much smaller footprint. We can use vertical reactors. And uh, the footprint can be very small for a large radiative input. It's scalable. And it's directly uh, adaptable to products that are more lucrative than biofuels, like antibody generation and pharmaceuticals. And so with that, I end the algae. And now the final one, the dessert for the photovoltaic audience which relates to the explosive growth of private commercial space missions, which dramatically alters the specifications for onboard uh, solar electricity generation. And it creates the need for novel concentrators in solar cells. And I'm going to show you why. But first, 
The history of space missions, they've all been driven by military and government organizations. Cost is no object as long as it's reliable. And with private space vehicles, cost is everything because if you don't turn a profit, you're gone. So again, it has to be reliable, but now it's not cost is no object, it's the complete opposite, cost is paramount. Let, I'll show you how that translates into a change in, fundamental change in design. And the PB cells on past satellites were ultra efficient, but also ultra expensive. So if we can concentrate, for example, by a factor of about 100, that vastly diminishes the cost of the photovoltaics. Obviously, I replaced 99% of the cells by uh, inexpensive optics. And what I'm about to show you is a program now, for me, this is uh, less than one year, a collaboration uh, with uh, professors at Penn State University in the United States of America and their colleagues at the United States Air Force. So if you don't think that sp uh, private space missions are something that is of great interest in the commercial sphere, um, this is just the, the beginning, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is, these are the names of companies that are already in the business. Uh, there are many more. And the market for onboard solar electricity production in private satellites today is about 10 megawatts. They pay about $100 a watt in space. So that translates in US dollars into about 1 billion. And you know it's going to only increase with time. Thanks to private initiatives, launch costs are falling rapidly. And therefore, the solar power is no longer a negligible fraction of the cost, it becomes a sizable fraction of the satellite cost. So certainly dollars per watt are pivotal, just like they are on Earth. But watts per kilogram becomes a really important figure of merit. It's crucial. And if you look at the room for improvement in watts per kilogram relative to the best solutions available today, the room for improvement is about a factor of four. So we need innovative optics, not just great solar cells. So let me show you a three-pronged strategy beyond the trivial economic virtue of concentration. Let's talk about the physics virtue of concentration. So the first, and again, with begging the indulgence of those who uh, know a lot about photovoltaics, um, if you have high-quality photovoltaics and you increase the irradiance, their efficiency can increase linearly in the logarithm of the optical concentration. These are measurements on some commercial uh, triple junction cells. So you see here, it's a logarithm of the concentration on the x-axis. So we can benefit on efficiency there. Watts per kilogram. More watts, same numbers of kilogram. Uh, th uh, the second one is to reduce the dimensions of the cells. The volume of the uh, solar cell system with the optics will scale as the cube of the linear dimension of the cell. So we have to shrink these to the minimum that's feasible. Um, this is just a sample drawing. We haven't built that yet for a cell that would be a 0.04 square millimeters. Um, and uh, you see the cell there on an American coin. That's a 10 cent coin in the United States. And here's a first little uh, optic between the, the thumb and index finger of my colleague at Penn State. Uh, so that's the second. We have to uh, ultra miniaturize the cells in order to get watts per kilogram up to a uh, to a very high level. And the final thing is what you people are probably better at than anyone, which is designing uh, the junctions and the fabrication methods, advanced multi-junction PV cells. The US Air Force has outsourced this to Naval Research Labs in the United States. They're now preparing for us, I'm supposed to receive this, this month for characterization, these five junction cells. They're supposed to be 0 0.17, 0 0.17 millimeters on a side. Remember, a piece of paper, standard paper, the thickness is 0.1 millimeters. So the thickness of these cells is less than two pieces of paper. Uh, there are two multi-junction cells. The two tandems, a three-junction, then a two-junction. You see what the junctions are here, and you see some uh, indication of their uh, quantum efficiency. And those two multi-junction cells are connected in parallel. The aim is to get 50% efficiency on the concentration of about 100. And uh, I'll be performing the characterization with my students in, the, in our lab at Ben Gurion University soon, which hopefully will guide the development of the future cells. Now about the optics. Concentration requires accurate tracking. You always have to be aimed at the sun. 
And the laws of optics, which really rate rooted in the second law in this case, the so second law of thermodynamics, dictate, mandate a basic relation between the maximum flux concentration that you can achieve and the optical tolerance half angle, let me call it theta. I'm assuming theta is small, so the sine and the angle are about the same. This is the maximum permitted misalignment I can have and still generate electricity that the satellite needs. So the basic relation is proportional to 1 over the square root of the concentration. U.S. Air Force says to me, you have to design for at least plus or minus 5 degrees tolerance. This is much bigger than any terrestrial concentrated photovoltaic system. It means the concentration cannot be too high, but it puts a great uh, pressure on how do you find satisfactory optics that can get high concentration at such liberal optical tolerance. So the feasible concentration cannot exceed 100. Uh, you, you see just the one idea there, which I'll return to for what an optic may look like. These are new demanding constraints, what I've just shown you in the last the three slides. Very low mass, ultra high efficiency, and high optical tolerance. What a combination. Uh, so th these are the new rules of the game. So the first quick and dirty prototype that we had to put on the table, the US Air Force wanted this for its uh, funders, was for a cell that's a bit bigger than what I showed you before. It's 0.65 by 0.65. So you cannot see the cell in this, uh, in this uh, photograph. You do see the optics there, the small mini dishes, if you will, reflective mini dishes. Of them, only 10 have the cell inserted. The other are awaiting them. Those are the ones that look black. If it looked if it looks black, it means that uh, optically you're unfolding the, uh, the photovoltaic absorber on the exit aperture, so the optics are doing their job. Each diagonal of those hexagons is five millimeters. So we're, we're already at the stage of uh, moving toward fabrication. Uh, challenges, can we make it, I haven't shown you what that optic was, but can it be ultra compact, ultra high performance? This is an example of a design we're considering right now to be glass molded. It's solid glass mirrored internally for the primary and second. This is an aplanatic optic. You see a typical solar ray being traced from the sun, from the incoming wavefront to the cell. In outer space, of course, out, out there is a vacuum. Why do we insist on filling it with glass? Again, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that uh, the attainable optical tolerance is proportional to the refractive index of the transparent material. For glass, it's 1.5 and we certainly want to take advantage of that. Plus, it, makes, it actually makes it easy to fabricate because we don't have to align the primary and secondary mirrors. They come out of the mold. Uh, the aspect ratio on this, as you can see, is about 0.3. Uh, consider most of you probably work with lenses of F numbers of about 1 to 2. So th th this is an enormous uh, improvement in compactness and therefore in watts per kilogram. The U.S. Air Force has now told me this is a new challenge we have to start thinking about. They said, um, these, these designs are nice. They pat you on the head and say, but we need something called a fail-safe option. Fail-safe means if the mechanical tracker fails completely, I can still get electricity. Oh, not the same level, but some electricity, just enough to keep things operating. Now, this is an example of what could qualify. Um, here you have a Fresnel lens, you have your multi-junction cell, and between them you stick in the best quality silicon cells you can. So if the sun is off axis, it doesn't strike your target, but it strikes something that's producing electricity. Now this works, of course, but the F numbers are so high that the compactness is unacceptable to them. So we have to now combine ultra-compactness, ultra-high performance, and fail-safe. And we're working on this. I didn't promise to show you final results, just where we are, where we're going. So this is highly challenging. Optics that are both compact and high performance for the fail-safe option. And let me show you a fringe benefit, which has nothing to do with private space missions, and I mentioned to Ned, when I was speaking with the US Air Force, they said, there's actually a fringe benefit for us. And I think for a photovoltaics audience, you may be familiar with it already, but if you're not, I, I think it's something that, that, that's quite tantalizing. The Air Force said, we have to send missions to Jupiter and Saturn. Now, the solar irradiance there, relative to planet Earth, uh, goes as one over distance squared. So on Jupiter, if, if I call the irradiance uh, on Earth 1, then in Jupiter it's 127th of that, and in Saturn it's 190th of that. Now, 
take your solar cell, your best solar cells, and operate them at 0.01 suns. And the shunt losses are enormous. They're, they're basically useless. Not to mention the fact, as Ned pointed out, that even in the high quality cells, the temperature will be so low that there are other very serious problems for the defects. And they said, if you can provide us with 100 concentration in something that, can, that is compact enough and light enough, then 1 90th of a sun becomes one sun. The temperature's back where it belongs. The shunt losses are rendered insignificant. And we can talk about serious photovoltaics there as well. So this is just the fringe. I'm not designing this for them, but they said, once you have the solution for our private missions, we, we'll be able to use this for far more distant missions. And just to give you a little bit of national pride, in case you weren't aware of it, by the way, I should mention I'm, a, I'm really loving being in Australia. This is a wonderful visit. Just, I'm in Perth right now, University of Western Australia, visiting for two months. But everything about the people I meet at the university and uh, just on the streets, people are so warm and welcoming and such a safe environment. And the weather is sensational, particularly when it's a cold winter in Israel. But so for a little bit of national pride, the Australian Space Agency was established less than a year ago. And you have a launch center, just in case you didn't know about it, in Womera Range Complex. There's the map. There's Adelaide to give you the uh, perspective. And there is their mission statement, which I admire very much, engaging with companies nationwide. They've already signed strategic statements with three industrial partners, investing all over Australia. Both South Australian startups have launched satellites and a payload that can help farmers and other industries. So maybe this work in the revival of concentrator photovoltaics for extraterrestrial missions will have some nice ramifications and uh, economic benefit here in Australia. And so with that, I will close and I'm happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Ah. Maybe one question no one has, because Jeffrey is going to stay here for another week. So I'm here till Friday afternoon. What did you hear about the, uh, the Airbus? <laughs> 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 Jeffrey, the Airbus? You want to expand on the Airbus? The Airbus. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> How fortuitous. Okay. Now I have physicists and chemists here, so you really understand it. The emission of photons. Photon statistics are Poisson statistics. You're all physicists and chemists. So you know what Poisson statistics are. If I have constant irradiation, it makes no difference what the statistics are because it's, it's, it's as if you're seeing an infinite number of photons. Right? The pool is full. Only one PQ is generated. Most of it is wasted. The statistics are irrelevant. But, but, <laughs> when I pulse light for 10 milliseconds on a one square nanometer target, I showed you the number, the number of photons being processed by that antenna per pulse is a number you can count on one hand. It's about five, maybe two hands, six, seven. This is the number. So each pulse is being absorbed by some antenna but only five or six or seven photons. And that's the whole event. Now we have to process and move on to the next. What is the standard deviation on a truncated Poisson distribution with six events? Six events. It's enormous, of course. This is the reason the error bars must be larger. And the biologists couldn't grasp it. They said, certainly it's larger because we're doing something in the experiment. We're not measuring the light. The algae behave differently. The said, no. No, your, your instrumentation is great. Look at the error bars and you can, t that's telling you your power meter is wonderful, your reactor is fab. These, those are the error bars you expect based on what you as biologists do. What I'm telling you is you have no control over it. And ask all your colleagues who have done flashing light experiments. No question, they must, they must have large error bars. Because physics doesn't allow you to have anything less than that. That is the convolution of the wonderfully tight error bars you have based on your particular instrumentation and what the laws of nature are imposing on you. And that's, 
That's, that's what I find so elegant. To, to be able to say, to, to, to tell them, you're not doing anything wrong. Don't worry, you don't have to re-examine your experimental techniques. The Poisson distribution is telling you that's the best you can do because the, the number of photons is so small. So that's the answer. Okay. <laughs>